nothing lasts forever. Even the most glorious reign, the most studded with success career, must come to an end. The greatest sagas end with the death of the hero, be she Joan of Arc, Beowulf, or King Arthur. No hero of myth gets out alive. Neither do we. Alfred Lord Tennyson understood this viscerally, and that's why he closed his Idols of the King with the passing of Arthur. It's the capstone, the finale of a long poetic retelling of the life and death of King Arthur, a Christian king in a pagan time, a king who sought to bring about justice and mercy in a cruel era. And before we dismiss this myth as trivial, antiquated, remember that for most of English history, it has been referred to as the matter of Britain. That is, that which makes us Great Britain. So in his final story, Mordred, Arthur's illegitimate son, seizes his father's kingdom and tries to force Guinevere, his father's wife, to marry him. Lancelot rescues her, but Arthur is forced to go to war against his own son, his closest friend, Lancelot, and the Knights of Camelot find themselves in a series of ever more chaotic battles in which those who falling down looked up for heaven but saw only the mist. Arthur kills Mordred in battle, but is himself terribly wounded. Of his knights, only Bedivere is left with the king, and Arthur commands him to return his sword Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake, who gave it to him when he was young, full of fire and promise. Bedivere can't bring himself to throw the sword in the lake. It's so beautiful. So he goes back and tells Arthur, yes, I have thrown it into the lake. Arthur may be dying, but he's not stupid. And he rebukes Bedivere for his lie. This happens another time. But then the third time, Bedivere finally obeys, only to see the sword is caught by a woman's hand rising out of the water. She brandishes it three times, and then she and the sword disappear forever. Now, as Monty Python tells us, uh, women handing out swords from a moat isn't exactly a good way to create a system of government. But to be fair, during the time of King Arthur, it appeared to work mo more often than not. What's really happened here, though, is Arthur is releasing the symbol of his worldly power, and he commits himself to trust those who have not always been there for him. In the last few verses of Arthur's telling, he gives himself to the three queens whose lives have woven in and out of his own, sometimes friend, sometimes foe, like Morgan Le Fay or Morgana. He trusts them to heal his wounds or to bring him to an honorable death, and they do not fail him. Arthur has, as the literary scholar Elizabeth Sandifer has put it, he's fallen out of the world. The world and its concerns are no longer for him. He gives us one warning through Bedivere and says, the old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. There's a certain irony here, because Arthur was a doer his whole life, a warrior, a king, a lawgiver, and yet the tragedy of Arthur ends with him placing his trust in God and asking his last friend, Bedivere, to pray for him. That's all. That's the myth. But today, we are not in a mythic place. We are at Golgotha, the place of the skull, Jesus of Nazareth, who preached mercy, love, and forgiveness, has fallen into the hands of the authorities and has been sentenced to death by crucifixion. It's a lingering death, one where the victim survives for just as long as his strength holds out, and Jesus, who has prayed to his Father to forgive them, all of them, 
from Judas to the guards watching the ghastly show, because they do not see their own cruelty. They do not recognize, they do not feel their own guilt. Like Arthur and Mordred's battling knights, they are blinded, unable to see anything around them but the mist, the mist of confusion, the mist of selfishness. And then a surprise occurs. The men crucified on either side of Jesus get into a conversation. Now the first man, traditionally known as Justice, the complainer, mocks Jesus, echoes the authorities crucifying them, and derisively says that Jesus is the Son of God, should just rescue the three of them, let's get down. Time to go. The other thief crucified with Jesus is traditionally known as Dismas, which means sunset or death. He rebukes Justice, asking him, do you not fear God? And he says, this man is innocent of the crimes for which he is dying, while we are guilty and deserve our death. And Dismas turns to Jesus and asks him to remember him. When he comes into his kingdom, Jesus answers, This very day, you will be with me in paradise. Unlike Arthur's confused men, Jesus does not call on heaven, nor does he see mist. Despite all he has been through since the Last Supper to this very moment, Jesus knows that his end is in fact a beginning, that he is not lost that the ordeal is not in vain, and that he and his newly found disciple will in fact be in God's kingdom before night has fallen. Now for us, as Jesus' followers, mind you, many years behind him, Arthur's insight that more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of must have meaning for us. We who today stand at the foot of Jesus' cross Despite the years that separate us from him, we have our role. We are witnesses well after the fact. And we can pray for our beautiful, scarred, brutal world. We can pray for those we love, for those who have harmed us, possibly most of all for those we have harmed. We can pray for all in need, and we can reach out and make that prayer reality. We can pray as Jesus did, and in his ministry, he made heroes out of cowards, saints out of sinners, including poor old Dismas, whether or not that was ever really his name. And we can stand here surveying the wondrous cross with Julian of Norwich, with the apostles, and we can warm our own hearts at Christ's fire, like the new fire that will lead us through the Easter vigil, and we can pray because old Arthur had that right. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. So instead of hunkering down, we can see what warmth we are able to kindle with our own prayers, embracing the warmth that will blaze anew as our Lenten fasting fades to once again be followed with Easter joy.